So it's all about building those connections and networks, I think is a really good way to get to be successful and just be true to who you are. Welcome to the Poultry Podcast Show. Today I am here with Dr. Dawn Coltes. Um, she's a colleague of mine, so I'm very excited to interview her. Welcome to the podcast show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I'm very excited to be here. So uh, I think for, for most of the people that might be listening, um, both of us are here at Iowa State University, but um, ironically, Don and I are in different buildings. So <laughs> this is kind of fun to be doing on the same campus. Um, I, I hope our Wi-Fi holds up. <laughs> Well, I can at least let you know what the weather is like as well. Exactly. Well, your shades are down, so it looks like it's sunny there as well. It is. <laughs> so, so Dawn, can you tell me how you got into chickens? Well, that's been kind of a long story and not a direct one. Um, so I grew up in Arkansas, which would seem like it would be a great place to start out a chicken. However, I grew up on the other side of the state. So I grew up in northeast Arkansas which if you've ever been there, one, I'm so sorry you were there, but two, um, it's very, very flat. So where I grew up, um, they had precision leveled fields, which meant they don't deviate more than three eighths of an inch for hundreds of acres. So very, very flat. Um, that's Rumor incredible. has it you can see a cop before they can actually detect you on the radar. So I don't know how true that is. <laughs> um, so I grew up with uh, a lot of rice fields around where um, around my house and we would rotate between uh, soybeans as well. But a lot of the folks I knew were going into agronomy and that was kind of their ag background. I didn't have that exposure. Uh, I didn't have 4-H or FFA very well in the area that I was at. So, you know, when it kind of came to what am I going to do with life afterwards, I turned into the black sheep of my family. Uh, my brother is in agronomy. My dad has done agronomy all his life. And I said, I want to go work with animals. And like most, most people, I was like, I'm going to be a veterinarian, right? And so <laughs> packed up all my belongings at the age of 18 and like, I'm out of here because I need some hills. And I moved four and a half hours northwest to uh, Fayetteville. And I started working in the animal science or actually I was uh, working on my degree in animal science and wanted to get some more experience with uh, animals. And so my advisor, Dr. Beth Kegley in the animal science department said, hey, I've got a job. Um, do you want to do it? I'm like, sure. And I didn't ask what it was. Probably <laughs> my fault there. Uh, because the first thing I did was they're like, hey, here's a box. Uh, the mice have gotten into the milk samples. You get to figure out which ones we keep and which ones we throw away. By the way, they're like a decade old. I'm like, okay. And so I started, that was where I started in the lab. And as it progressed, I get to work with a lot of different aspects of a lab. And I found I really liked it. But Sorry, there's maybe a little offensive here. I found out I didn't like nutrition. Like I wasn't one that wanted to go out and feed at two in the morning and pull bags out of rumens and, you know, that type of thing didn't appeal to me. So as a rebellious young adult, I decided to do the counter opposite of that. So I went into genetics and I came to Iowa State University and started a master's in animal breeding and genetics and actually uh, completed both a master's in animal breeding and genetics and a PhD in genetics. But I really wasn't doing genetics. Um, and I was working in the dairy industry at that time. And, you know, I was working on kind of this, this interplay between metabolism and nutrition and physiology. So I really had a strong connection with the physiology standpoint and more cellular biology. And along the way, I ended up meeting somebody and trying to find two academic jobs as not an easy task. So when we found something and I could do a postdoc, um, and in fact, it was actually a research scientist position, we ended up moving back to the University of Arkansas, which my family loved. Uh, I don't know about my spouse's family because he's from Wisconsin, so that might have drawn some, uh, some contingency there. But we moved back to the University of Arkansas in the Fayetteville area. And at that point, I started working with chickens. Um, so I was um, housed in the poultry science department, kind of working across both of them with kind of those skill sets. And, you know, chickens have cells and they're fascinating because the chicken cells are very different from a genetic standpoint compared to our mammalian cells. Um, and then the way that they work is still really unique and a lot of it's not known. And so that leaves a lot of opportunity to ask the questions, 
are they the same as all the other species or are we just making assumptions? And I find sometimes we make assumptions. And so what's really nice is being on that forefront to ask the questions of, well, just because it works in the human this way, just because it works in the pig this way, doesn't mean it works in our poultry this way. And so being able to ask those questions and really drive some of that research is really fascinating. Um, and it also is kind of challenging dogma. And so I really like that aspect of it. Yeah, that is quite the, the roundabout way. Plants to uh, dairy <laughs> to chickens. But hey, they all are all are on the same food, right? <laughs> Corn, right, soybeans. they are. And I will tell you, the rice fields are 100% the reason I don't consume beer because those rice fields smell exactly like Budweiser to me. Uh, oh my that's God. Actually one of the, yeah, so if you didn't know, uh, Arkansas is the number one production of rice. Sorry, here's my little plug for the state. Um, and they sell most of their rice to Anheuser-Busch. That's incredible. Is it a specific uh, strain or like genetic strain to get the taste or is it just uh, like a white rice in general? It's just a white rice, but it is a short grain rice um, to oh. grow the longer grain rice that would be like jasmine or Botswani, uh yeah. rice. Those are more difficult to grow yeah. um, and they're not as, you don't get as much rice per acre. And so yeah. from that standpoint, we grow a shorter yeah. shorter grain rice. And if you get Riceland rice, Minute Maid rice, those types of rice are uh, the types of rice that we grow. Huh, that's incredible. I, I didn't think there was anywhere that was flatter than Iowa, but you've proven me wrong. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> this is hilly for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> oh, so uh, so um, what was your path after working at Arkansas? Because you're up here back in Ames, Iowa again. <laughs> yeah. So my, my time at Arkansas was actually fairly short. Uh, we were there for about a year and a half. Um, the position I was in was a research scientist position and the movement up into a position that would be more permanent and would have more flexibility for research and teaching wasn't going to be there. So there were some positions that opened up at Iowa State University and both my spouse and I applied for positions and ended up moving back. And when you want to talk about poultry, Iowa is a, a fertile ground for growth in poultry. Um, from a student standpoint, uh, we have quite a few chickens around here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Most of them are laying hens, which is very different than the broilers. And we have a lot of turkeys as well. So different aspect than what it's like at the University of Arkansas. Yeah, cool. So what have you been doing since uh, since you came to Iowa State University? I know you've got quite an emphasis on, on teaching, but you also have been doing research as well. Right. Um, so I do spend quite a bit of my time teaching supposed to be 60%. Uh, so I teach an anatomy and physiology class um, for all of our sophomores, I teach a poultry fellows class. So I usually hit up a few folks every once in a while to come in and speak to those students. Um, teach in the COE program with the avian physiology class, lead or advise the poultry interest group and Sigma Alpha. So a lot of student work and, and engagement in that area, which I really love. From the research side with the new Robert T. Hamilton poultry teaching and research facility to make sure I get all the words in the right order. Um, we've had the opportunity to kind of go in and do some more expansion on an egg industry center grant that we uh, had for commercial laying hens, where we were looking at the uh, ileal ecology. So the different microbes that are in uh, conventional housed hens in the ileum compared to uh, aviary or cage free. And so we see a lot of shifts in, some of the bacterium that are there, as well as some of the um, eukaryotic sequences. So for instance, one that might not be surprising is we see an increase in the sequence count for Imeria in our cage-free facilities compared to our conventional cage, right? So we know that there's more exposure. We say that this happens, but we can actually physically see that with the counts in the reads. So that's been a, a really kind of fun discovery and seeing that we've been able to take it to our research farm and expand in that area, looking at differences in our caged birds versus our free range or cage free birds, I should say. Um, and just trying to tease out some of that data there, looking at even how some of these are related back to some of our intestinal stress markers. So fitzy dextrin, even changes in morphology, as well as changes in stress. So we're looking at corticosterone. 
Um, one of the cool things is while I've had graduate students that have worked on it, we've had the ability to allow some undergraduates to take ownership of certain parts. So I've had an under, actually two undergrads work on the corticosterone assay, graduate student was working on uh, all the other components. So they've had that ownership and, and hopefully we'll get to, well, one of them will be presenting a PSA on the topic. So it's very exciting. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that is. Um, so I, I know for your, the classes that you teach, you have just a wide ar- array of uh, the enrollment from the student side. So anywhere from, you know, a small kind of more intimate group with the poultry fellows out to a couple hundred, right, for, for the physiology class. So um, how do you deal with teaching various size classes? Like, do you have tips and tricks for teaching really big classes? Um, one of the, the things that I really encourage is active learning. Um, and we see that sometimes when it gets to that larger class size, one of the first things that we do is we tend to go, okay, here's my PowerPoint. I'm going to click through it. I'm going to talk through it. Um, I've actually tried to take a step back from that because a lot of our students come in from high school, they don't know how to take notes because they've been either given all the material just the same way. Here's your PowerPoint. Here's, you know, the video to go watch. So they don't know how to take notes. So I really encourage, especially with that large physiology class, here's how to take notes and demonstrate that to them in in a live manner. So actually write on PowerPoint slides, not chalkboard anymore, but PowerPoint slides to to try and get them to engage. So that's one way of kind of getting them to engage with the material. The other is, I know I can't reach all of them and and memorize their names. It's 200 a semester and that gets very difficult for me. Um, I admire all the people that can memorize and know all 200 students or, you know, 7,500 students that they have in class. So I commend those folks. I'm not one of them, but I try to get them to engage with each other. Because I figure if they can develop their own communities, then they have somebody to go talk to when they don't understand something I've just said. Um, they don't feel comfortable coming to talk to me. And we do what are called uh, like turn to your partner activities where I will throw out a topic. Um, you know, sometimes it's and I teach a very general domestic animal physiology class. So our last one included. So what is A2A2 A2 milk? And have the students actively think about that. Or, okay, here's my, my better poultry example. What is the maternal recognition of pregnancy for poultry? <laughs> and, you know, they sit there for a while and, and I have them record their answers on a note card with their name. So it's very simple for them. Uh, but then you can, you can hear the memories like, I don't know. What was it? And, you know, then I'll be like, okay, let's, let's talk about it amongst your pairs and then come back and talk about it amongst the class. And so it's fun trying to watch them, especially in that example figure out like, well, we think that ovipositioning or laying of the egg is going to be maternal recognition of pregnancy. And it comes down to the end and I go, okay, question, do birds get pregnant? And then there's like this, how did I miss that? (laughs) You know, so some of those types of activities to get them to think about the material we're talking about and engaging in that. Um, That one's probably my harder class to get a lot of engagement, but occasionally we have some really good discussions with our smaller classes. um, The poultry fellows class is all about getting them to engage with industry. Uh, So I'll bring in speakers and I think they hate it. They usually start joking around about it now, but I have them introduce themselves. You know, who are you? Where are you from? What's your major? And then depending upon the speaker. So when the egg industry comes or when the turkey industry comes, I go, okay, so what's your favorite way to have eggs? Or how do you think birds drink? Or what's your favorite? So when we've had water companies come in, it'll be like, so what do you think about beverages? Do you like your beverage hot, cold, iced, or whatever? Just to spur some general conversation. And they seem to connect with our speakers a little better that way and ask questions and, and get involved, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, you, uh, do you have any plans to kind of start on the scholarship of teaching? Do you see yourself like working, using your classes as like research examples to know how to continue kind of developing that side of, of your appointment? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you look at it from a research standpoint, I have been experimenting it at 200 every semester, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody yeah. should be so lucky. And so I, I do have some plans to look at some of that. One of my first initial plans was to look at how note-taking and how students take notes impacts overall performance or even improvement in certain areas. Um, 
started that one at the spring of 2020. So mm-hmm. it kind of shifted a little bit. Uh, so <laughs> instead of then having live classes that they were capturing, and I, I would basically have them send their for their participation would be here, take a picture of your notes. Uh, if you don't take notes, take a picture of the ceiling, take a picture of the floor, or just say none or, or whatever. The way they mm-hmm. got their score was simply from sending in the email correctly. That was it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I kind of wrecked that and I haven't picked that back up yet because we're still working <laughs> on getting students back in the habit of taking notes and, and things of yeah. that nature. So um, I have been working on trying to do um, a, a renovated book so that we're moving away from human textbooks and moving into more of a domestic animal textbook. And so with that, there'll be some changes to the class and I'm hoping that we'll be able to take some of that to scholarship. So how does using electronic based homework work versus making them develop their own study guide? How does that improve that learning and retention? Yeah. What are you finding um, from the years before and after having to move online? Are you finding that students are you said they're relearning how to take notes, but just in a like a general format, is the engagement different? Are you having more trouble getting students engaged post COVID? I think I've found that um, the engagement has been hard <laughs> for any size class. <laughs> yeah, and I think that is something that we all have talked about, whether it's in a, a larger group or individual settings. the The student after COVID is very different. Um, they've been very accustomed to taking like rewatching videos or taking mm, their own time yeah. doing some videos. Um, I have kept a portion of my class online for those mm-hmm. students that are remote. And I've had a few that are taking the domestic animal physiology class from Missouri or, or even uh, internationally. And mm-hmm. so that allows them that flexibility because it's asynchronous. But those students I find do really struggle with retaining that material more. Um, mm. Just looking yeah. at exam averages and, and things of that nature. So one of the things I definitely found is that the information they knew coming into the class is lower. Um, so um, one of the class, I give a pre-quiz and then a post-quiz to see how much they've gained in terms of knowing knowing some of the material. And there used to be two or three questions that everybody would get, you know, very mm-hmm. basic biology questions they got in some of the prereq courses. They're not getting those correct now. And mm. so it's a little it's a little disturbing, but it's also one of those things of, okay, well, I need to make sure to keep it a little more basic when they seem to get a little bit more like drifting, like, Oh, I think they're bored. They're probably Mm -hmm. not bored. They're probably lost. And so for me, that's been my biggest teaching adjustment is going, wait, the students aren't bored. I think I've just gone over their head. So I need to take a few steps back, either repeat what I said, rephrase what I said, um, or go through that material very differently again. Um, So, so from the domestic animal physiology to the course that you'll be teaching here in a couple weeks, the avian physiology, uh, what, what fun things do you get to do in this avian specific class? I think (laughs) it's probably a very exciting to be able to teach just chickens for two weeks. (laughs) Oh, it is. Um, And the other thing is I get to have a lab component. So while the domestic animal physiology class I teach on campus has a lab component, I don't get to teach that one. So the ability to interact with students in small groups goes away. So that is one of the more exciting things about the avian physiology is that I get to interact with them in a lab setting. So Mm -hmm. I have to say the labs are probably some of my more fun times because, you know, it's all about learning how to handle a chicken or bleed a chicken, or we're going to do some right staining. So have them do blood Mm -hmm. smears and count cell types. So some of it is seeing the wheels turn in a very different mechanism than here I am just lecturing you. So Mm -hmm. I really, really enjoy that component. The other part is some of the engagement we do. So we do um, a group debate at the end of it, and we have it based on physiological topics that are relevant to the industry. So things such as lighting intensity and broilers. Should we keep it at five to 10 lux or should we move toward the European standards that are 20 to 25 lux? So mm-hmm. then they have to kind of dive into some of that research and justify their side because they're they're not allowed to pick. It's chosen for them. So I'm like, <laughs> you get to be this side and you get to be this side. Um, and so we're trying to work on some of those soft skills that we hear the industry is, is interested in them gaining a bit more on. Um, learning on how to form a a concise uh, topic and how to present that in a short manner, how to respond to something that is opposite of what you've had and how to take questions. So those are our big goals with that one. 
But the fun part about it um, that we also get to do is during the course, instead of teaching for three hours straight, which nobody wants to do, um, either me or the ones receiving that lecture, we break them up. And so usually the first one I do is, okay, everybody split a Coke or Pepsi. You get to pick your side and then you guys get to come up with an argument for whose side is, whose soda is better or McDonald's French fries versus Wendy's French fries. And so, you know, just this, yeah, we did that one last, last summer. It was fun. Oh, some so of the these ones are really hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, cake versus pie, dogs versus cats. So it's a very general topic, right? And it's all more about feelings, but you can construct an argument like cake is better because of da, 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 or pie is better because of X, Y, and Z. And so the whole idea is for them to have more of a friendly discussion about it versus a really scientifically rigor one. Um, and then, so I teach with Dr. Greg Fraley. So he and I will sit in on these debates at the end. And of course we get to ask questions and we tell them either they ask questions or we get to, so they get to choose and you can guess what they pick. <laughs> oh gosh, that's too funny. So um, what are some of the, the topics that you find, at least when you teach uh, the, the avian specific, that the students maybe have a, a less understanding of just because it's something that's bird specific? Um, probably the biggest one is the respiration or respiratory system. Uh, the bigger thing there is, is so different compared to what they've been traditionally taught. So if mm -hmm. we think about the mammal, the mammal has, you know, just lungs and that's where gas exchange occurs. Same occurs in the birds, but we don't have air sacs. We have a diaphragm. Um, mm -hmm. And all the movements are a little bit different. So it's it's really trying to get them to think about how air moves and how our air moves differently. And so we have a one cycle. So air comes in, gets exchanged, and then comes back out. Birds, it goes into air sacs, then moves into the lung, then to air sacs, and then out of the body. Mm -hmm. So we talk about that as a two cycle compared to a one cycle. Yeah. And sometimes that's where they stumble. Yeah. So, And it's also a hard one to come up with a lab for. So... This yeah. year may be a complete disaster, but we're trying something new. I'm going to make them build their own respiratory systems out of like balloons and tubes and things of that nature. And we'll see how it goes. So that may be a complete disaster and I'll say never again, or maybe they will say never again. <laughs> uh, I would like, I would like to know if it's a disaster or not, because the hands-on stuff for the classes I teach always kind of solidifies an idea in their mind. So I really like doing the hands-on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I figure worst case scenario, they've had to work through how it should work, even if it doesn't work and we have to talk about it. And so it's going to be our Friday lab, which is usually a, a tougher lab anyway, because everybody's like, oh, oh, I'm yeah. tired of being here. Tired. It's been a long week. And, and just having a different creative component, activating different parts of the brain, things of that nature. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, I know you've also done, so you involve undergraduates in your research, um, but you've also done quite a bit of work about summer internships with some different organizations in Iowa. Can you tell us about how you're getting undergrads involved over the summer in these internship programs? So we have a George Washington Carver program that's established on campus. Uh, this is a program that helps with underrepresented groups and identifying and research programs and getting those students involved. I have participated in that program twice with three different students. And so um, it's always fun to get these students who come in from various parts of the US to see something very different. The two students I had last summer were from Texas and Louisiana, but they were both going to a school in Louisiana. And they had never been around turkeys and involved in anything of that nature. And I took them to the Iowa Turkey Federation Summer Convention as something different and to get them involved and to see the different different ways in which industry works, right? Because a lot of these students are still in that mindset of, if I'm going to be in poultry or swine or beef, I'm going to be working with the animal every day. And that's not the case. So just exposing them to people who work in allied industry and the different facets that go into these poultry careers. So that was kind of fun. They also sat in on the board meeting and they had some very, very unique reactions to it. I didn't think it was heated, but they were like, man, it got heated there for a while. And I'm like, I didn't see that. Maybe I, I view things very differently when we have discussion. And even if the tempo goes up a little bit, maybe I don't view it as, as heated. Yeah, <laughs> that's too funny. Um, 
Have you have you had the chance to work with industry groups for like uh, Iowa State students and set up internships that way? I know that there was some potential in the last year or so working with those groups just so they get access to students because they love having interns. <laughs> oh, they do. And for our poultry students, I find that they don't see the opportunities as much mm -hmm. as we do. So some of the opportunities might be with a a name of a company mm -hmm. and that company may do a lot of different species. So they don't understand that poultry is involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that uh, Morgan Minahan, excuse me, Morgan Pothoven at Iowa Turkey Federation and I ha had this question of how do we get students involved and, and how do we get them involved in, in this case, Turkey specific internship programs. So we had them actually apply with it if they were interested to this program. We'll just call it a program. It's very loose at the at this point anyway. And then once we get students who are interested, we get their CVs and we go, okay, where can we best sit these students or position these students to go and do and experience what they want? And so the first year we had 10 students apply and we were able to get one or two of them that still didn't have an internship by the end of it, an internship in the industry. And it allowed them to have kind of this exposure to a broad range of areas because it was one of our, our integrator companies. And so they were able to, to go to the hatchery and go live production and visit with a vet for a couple of days, you know, weeks and mm -hmm. go to the processing plant and see how the whole industry works. Um, and this year we had one applicant that we were also able to successfully place into a, an internship program. I guess recruitment and marketing was low this year, so that must be on my end. Um, but you know, we're, we're working with these students to try and meet them where they're at. We know that these companies are interested and the students have interest, but sometimes they just can't find each other. And so we're hoping to be that link to help them find somebody. Yeah. Yeah. So for a student that's looking or maybe even listening to this podcast, how do you get connected to somebody who might be able to help you with the internship? And then what does your internship look like? What does that summer look like for a student that is doing an internship? Yeah. So for a student that's interested, I would encourage you to reach out to someone in the, probably a faculty member in the industry. So Iowa State, you know, Dr. Bobeck and I are definitely very happy to help connect those students because we get people who will email us or in random conversations. I'm sure you've had this. I know you've been on the emails um, that'll say, hey, I've got a job. I've got an internship. I've got this opportunity well, I spam a lot of students with the poultry interest group because I just send those along to that group. But, you know, I don't know what the response rate is for that. But if you're really interested, reaching out to somebody who has that connection uh, is a great way to do that. So if it's me, then great. I'm happy to help try and make those connections. If it's Dr. Bobeck or someone in your department, that's a really great way to get that connection started. Um, the other thing is I have to say LinkedIn is a really good resource, right? because um, it allows students to see what jobs are being posted based on feeds, right? And so I have struggled with how do I, how do I get all these, these jobs, these internships to students without having basically spamming them every other day. And yeah. so one of, it, it can get that bad around graduation, <laughs> right? And so um, it's, it's an easy way for me to like or reshare or repost some of these opportunities that I see from the groups that I follow, not all of them are poultry related. Uh, so I encourage anyone to, to connect with faculty members at your university or people. Most people will connect on LinkedIn, even if there's not a really strong connection, just for the sheer fact of now I can share information with folks. And so that's a way that I try to share some of that information. I am open for better ways to do it, but I haven't found them yet. I get it. It can, it can be hard because sometimes students don't even know they might be interested in the poultry industry. <laughs> That's very true. I think most of the undergrads that were in my lab or throughout the time probably only had a couple that came in with an actual poultry interest. Like I want to work in a poultry lab. The rest of them are, I would like to gain experience into vet school, or I would like to gain uh, more handling experience or experience in the lab. And then they get into a little bit with poultry and they find out that, wait, chickens aren't as scary as I thought they were. Turkeys are kind of cute when they're little. Um, and so you start to build that connection and they, the, the mist moves away, if you will. So they, they become demystified on what the poultry industry looks like, 
which is probably our greatest challenge of getting students in. People don't know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, for a student that does successfully get an internship, maybe maybe for some of the ones that you've just done the last two summers, what what does that experience look like? And it all depends on, I think, the student and that that um, company that picks them up. So for the integrator that we worked with, they did a wonderful job of setting it up to where every two weeks that student was rotating into a new program. Um, on top of that, they were also having one day a week that they set up for personal and professional development. So that might be that they were going to a summer convention or a conference that the vet was going to, or that they were just taking time to build and revise their resume and having somebody from the HR department at that institution go, okay, let's sit down and talk about how we can make your resume something that will catch the eye and get you a job or an internship at a higher at a better rate. The other thing is they were also focusing on, you know, some of the things like mental health and work-life balance and, and all of those types of aspects that sometimes we at academics, I think we recognize they're important, but we don't know how to express that to a large group of students. Yeah. Oh, wow. That, that sounds pretty interesting. I think the rotating aspect would draw anybody in. You get to see a lot of, yeah. I have to say, I was like, can I sign up to go for yeah. this internship over the summer? I mean, it's 12 <laughs> weeks. Surely my boss will let me off, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, gosh, that's too funny. So um, have you have you had any students that came back from the internships that were just totally hooked? Like, what, what do the students think when they come back from these things? Um, so we've had one student that came back. I haven't spoken with that student too much about that internship opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, with the folks that I talked with, there seems to be a really good connection. Yeah. Um, again, we haven't had that many students go through that program and yeah. I'm hoping to keep track of the other that goes through this summer. Yeah. Um, with other, I guess, when it comes to internships, we, as a department and as a, a group at Animal Science, are pushing a lot more of these internships. I think we need to make sure that as students look for internships, they're looking at how is my growth potential, mm. um, not just a paycheck and not just I can write this on my resume because that's that's a summer job and there's nothing wrong with summer jobs. But if you're going to have an internship, think about how it's going to stretch you to grow. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is I'm stretching to grow in an area I really like and I find out I like it. Or it might be that I I thought I was going to like this area, but I really don't. Yeah. And, and that's good, right? You got to know what you like. And you got to know what you don't like. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's a really, really important point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I figured out I, I didn't care for as much nutritionist because I, I didn't want to feed and weigh and do all of that. Then I go to grad school and I feed and weigh dairy cattle. <laughs> and then I go and, you know, get a job where I'm feeding and weighing chickens and turkeys. So clearly I don't listen to myself when I say these things. But... <laughs> Uh, well, um, the students that I teach in my nutrition class, uh, the, it'll be starting next week, but I, I tell them, I know none of you are going to like some of the things we do, but you're not going to get away from it. So you get, just got to learn to tolerate it. And some of you are going to love it. So you got to tolerate it either way. <laughs> so I, I understand. Um, I was on the, the opposite side, man. Genetics is my, was the bane of my existence in college. I could just never figure out where I was supposed to put the little GFP so something could fluoresce in a, oh man, never got that figured out. So <laughs> sounds like we had opposite struggles. <laughs> it did. Well, and I mean, like I liked being in the lab. I did not like, it was mostly the 2 a.m. I was the yeah. one elected because I was the undergrad yeah. and I lived close to campus. I was yeah. the one elected to go dig out in situ bags from rumens at three in the morning. And I thought I was going to get kicked out of my living space. So I, I was renting a house with four other girls who were secondary education majors. They did not like the smell of rumen fluid at two in the morning. And they were like, you should wash those. I'm like, but I'm going to put them back on at 8 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, researchers are a special breed, no matter what field you're in. <laughs> you got to really yeah, like it. Very true. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Um, so, so recently at Iowa State, we just finished a huge project, which um, is the turkey facility. And you, you were the faculty 
I don't want to say organizer because it was much more than that, but since you kind of headed up the project from the the Iowa State side, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that building? We finally got turkeys in the finisher, so it's really exciting. <laughs> yeah, um, so very, very excited about this facility. So you're, you may have to cut me off or um, <laughs> at some point along the way, because this is something that uh, I guess I've, I've been part of since the day I started back here at Iowa State. And it's been a very, very exciting project for a number of reasons. But probably the biggest is um, getting to work with the industry group. So the Iowa Turkey Federation, the Iowa Turkey Growers have been instrumental in this, uh, not only from the financial side of actually raising funds, either as individual farmers or as groups, but also as a great resource to say, this is going to work, or I don't think that's going to work. Um, and also being willing to go, okay, we understand it's a research barn and things are going to be different, but let us, let's provide either a little bit of insight on how we see things working and, and helping drive some of the, the ways in which we can build that. I, there's no way that we could have gotten the facility that we have without the Iowa Turkey Federation, without the Iowa farmers, without Greta Irwin more specifically in that uh, push. So I want to make sure that I, I get all those things out there. First, because they have been the ones that really, really pushed this this project forward, and it's been tremendous. So, one, I, I thank them for their help and their willingness to open arms for both of us and and the whole Iowa State community into, hey, if you're gonna, if you want to do this, let's let's do it together and let's really roll up our sleeves and work at it. And I'm I'm gonna throw out there also, I mean, you were on the committee and you've helped greatly as well, but I want to touch on our our ag systems bioengineering group as oh, well. Yeah. Uh, because we're trained as animal scientists. We're trained as poultry scientists. We're not trained in how ventilation works and <laughs> the ins and outs and the different types and, and how structures are. Without them, you know, it's going to be, a, it would be a very different facility. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm really glad to have both Rich Gates and, and Brett Ramirez on that, that team as well to help push that forward. Um, so it's been a, a great learning experience. So that's probably my first part there is it's really great. And so I encourage people, especially undergrads or graduate students that are listening to this, make sure you make connections and fields outside your area, because those become your resources later on. So those are those have been the really great ones this time. But the facility itself um, is also very exciting. We have the ability to go from hatch to processing in our facility which is very unique in, in Turkey because these are big birds and they have a long production cycle, particularly compared to broilers, right? So we're going 20 weeks with our toms compared to six weeks with our broilers. Um, and so we have the ability to brood 1,800 birds and move them over into our grower finisher. We have the ability to do up to four different dietary treatments and keep a really good statistical number. We have the ability to do four water treatments in each pen. So that's the biggest thing is that pen level water treatment, which is super exciting. Uh, I don't have any plans for it yet, but I'm just really excited about it. Yeah. The capability is important. It is. It is. The ability to tell people we have some of this and can do some of these things. It's amazing to see all those wheels turn. I'm, I'm sure you've experienced that well when you talk to people and they're like, oh, wait a minute, we can do this too. And you're like, yeah, that might be a different project. But yeah, we can do that too. Um, we have two rooms to do environmental treatments for each of our brooder and our, our grower finisher. So we have 16 pens in each of our brooder rooms. And then we have, I have to do that, 32 pens in each of our grower finisher rooms. We have, um, now I've lost, do water, feed, environmental. We also have data ports with each of our pens, which for those that do behavior like yourself, Liz, that's a, a great opportunity to be able to gather that much data um, and not be restricted to a specific area to do that or have to bring in massive equipment and drill holes in the ceiling, which I'm sure a <laughs> farm manager is so appreciative of not having that happen uh, yet um, for any of those 96 pens. So it's just, it's a great opportunity and we're super, super excited about it. Uh, We've had, I think we're on our second trial right here going through. So we had a, a brooder study or brooders that went through and trying to work out the brooder. We had a, a 
study that went through with our second flock. And now those are on a kind of a betting trial right now, just to kind of make sure our systems work out, but we can also gather some data from, from those birds as well. And so they're going to finish up here very soon. And then we'll have our third flock going in, which is very, very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's an amazing opportunity. Um, I, I don't know about the availability or the sizing of some of the other places across the United States, but to have this here on campus, I think is pretty phenomenal. <laughs> It is. It is. Uh, most folks only go out to for that brooding period because well, they're about right. the size of a broiler. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of data that can be generated in that short period of time. But it's it's not the whole bird. It's not the whole bird cycle. And the yeah. turkey industry, like the duck industry, like the laying hen industry, has very limited data compared to the broiler industry. Oh, yeah. Or even some of our other mammalian counterparts. So yeah. it's really exciting to have a facility to do and ask some of those questions. Oh, exactly. Um, and for for anyone who's wondering, we're raising them all year round, not just for Thanksgiving. That's a good a good thing to point out. <laughs> yep, we'll be raising. So we raise toms, which are for the that feather processed product type mm-hmm. of thing. So deli meats, and so yeah, get enjoy. I enjoy my Jimmy John's. I enjoy my Subway. I enjoy just going and getting deli meat and enjoying a turkey sandwich most days. So. I am obsessed with the Jimmy Dean's turkey sandwiches, the breakfast sandwiches. Ugh, they're so good. <laughs> the little turkey fatties. Yeah, good job. <laughs> My house is obsessed with the griddle sticks. So the, oh, yeah. the link of sausage wrapped in the pancake. Um, yeah. That is that goes over so well at my house for breakfast. Yeah. Uh, um, I also love the turkey bacon. I know bacon is a pork product, but the turkey version of bacon is perfect because they're, even though I love the taste of the pork, the turkey does not spatter grease when you cook it. I love that. <laughs> it's such a clean, you don't have to clean up around when you're done. And it tastes, I think it tastes really good. So yeah, I'm into turkey. <laughs> That's good. I, I like tenderloins and when I get the cutlets, oh, yeah. like the sliced breast, um, those make serve some really good grilling like steaks. And so they're really good. We've gotten into smoking. Yeah, we're in trouble there. Uh, I, I, I'm into that too. I mean, any most most meats are pretty good, <laughs> especially when you smoke them. They just you know get that much better. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, so is there is there any topic um, throughout all of the teaching and research and the other opportunities that we've talked about in the last forty minutes or so? Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you're burning to cover? <laughs> oh. That is a good question. I feel like we've, we've hit a lot of the the discussion points of, of things that are going on and yeah. things that w- are continuing to go on. Um, I mean, I don't think so. I'm trying to think. <laughs> so Maybe it's because it feels like a ready. Friday afternoon. Yeah, it's finals week this week, and we're uh, heading into teaching for the Midwest Poultry Consortium, which will be here on campus, which we're very excited about, but... Um, it'll, it's a quick turnaround with finals week just ending. <laughs> so yeah, I am, I am so happy. I have a two week break. Um, I don't envy you to have a day break because you get Friday yeah. off and then back into it again. So it's, oh, yeah. it is a uh, really nice to have two weeks to kind of get my, my orientation back again and then come back at teaching again that way. Oh yeah. It's time for our famous three. Ivonic stands for a holistic and sustainable value proposition for livestock production. It combines products and services and leverages digital solutions. This is all backed with high value consultancy and deep customer understanding. Ivonic turns science-based efficient nutrition, sustainable healthy nutrition, and precision livestock farming into value for customers and consumers. Working with nature and not against it. Chickens fed AX3 Digest consume significantly less feed and water to produce one pound of meat. Successful flock performance is determined during the first 10 days post-placement. AX3 Digest is a highly digestible novel protein that most improved in barn performance, bird health, and a drier litter. For more information, visit www.protecta.com. 
Um, so I'll, I'll end the podcast today with the three questions that we ask um, all of our, our guests. So our first one is, what is your favorite poultry-related resource? Oh, resource. Um, or book. So I, yeah. Yeah. And so I tend to, to fall back on Sturkey's avian physiology. I don't have the latest version, so I'm probably going to have to, to um, talk with Dr. Skeins about maybe updating a copy here and there. Uh, I think I have the sixth edition, but that's one of my favorite ones to pull out. One of my other favorites is How the Chicken Crossed the Globe. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you've read that one. I haven't. Oh, it is a it's a fabulous book, and it talks more about how chickens got to be where they are. Mm. Um, and so we talk. It talks about the movement from Southeast Asia into you know different parts and how we've moved from and evolved from you know this bird that was in a backyard all the way into our broilers and our laying hens that are now more yeah. efficient, more productive in certain areas. Um, I've actually loaned my copy to Dr. Sterley. So mm. maybe at some point you'll have to go down and borrow it from her. Um, yeah. One of the things that struck me the most outside of all the fascinating things about how the chicken evolved and I mean, it goes into cockfighting and some of the other things oh, that yeah. actually push some of the, the movement of the bird but there's a, a part where the author goes to talk to the industry and the industry doesn't talk back. And it's very disheartening because the person that they got to talk was somebody who was part of an animal sanctuary. And so they were talking about all the mishaps that they saw because of their location and, and some of those things. So it, it makes me sit and go, if we're not talking, then there's nothing to listen to. And so we have to make sure to be cognizant to answer questions, answer them directly, and make sure that we're following up with some of those things. So oh, good book yeah. from a history standpoint, from a kind of a learning standpoint, definitely one of my non resource related reads, but it's still a good read. Gosh, well, the historical, that, that's really interesting. I'll have to get that on my, my, re my reading list for the summer. Um, the, the second question is, what's your favorite non poultry related book or resource? Um, so I have really gotten into two authors recently. Uh, so Malcolm Gladwell and Adam Grant, and they do podcasts too. So I get oh. very excited and listen to their podcasts. But the, the one that probably started me on this path is a book called David and Goliath, Underdogs, mm -hmm. Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. And oh. it's a really cool book because it flips kind of this perspective of who actually had the advantage in different situations, particularly one of the stories is about David and Goliath. Um, so a person who was considered a small, small human being, so David here, and then Goliath, a giant who most likely had a pituitary disorder, and that's how he got to be a giant. So it goes into more of the historical standpoint, not necessarily the biblical standpoint. Um, and it was like, who really has the advantage? So is it somebody who's been slinging rocks their entire life to protect their sheep flock? Or is it somebody who has a disease that likely can't see? And the whole time we've been thinking that Goliath had the advantage when in fact it was probably David. And so as we go into who are the underdogs and what makes them underdogs and who are the ones that we think are on top and, and why they're that way, what struggles are really going under there? And so it's just a really cool book. I probably botched it um, in terms of telling that one story, but it has a lot of different stories and, and it really just makes you think about how, how everybody has a story, how everybody has things they're working through and struggling with. Um, and so kind of just rethinking things is part of what Malcolm Gladwell does. And then Adam Grant is more about how do we think about things in organizational ah. psychology and some yeah. really fascinating things to think about. Yeah. It's a definitely a, a sage point. <laughs> Perspective is really important. <laughs> It is. You know, it's always better. We can always fix things after they happen, right? We can always see how, well, if you'd have oh, done yeah. X, Y, and Z, it would have gone off perfectly. Well, yeah. that's, of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. We can always see the big picture there, but in the moment we can't. We have to remember that when we are looking at things. So, Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, a, that's definitely good advice. Um, so the last question is... Um, how, how do people become successful in the poultry industry? What kind of advice would you give someone looking to enter or who's already in the industry? So I guess one of the biggest advice, I'm not sure that I would necessarily hit this. I feel like I haven't hit successful yet, um, but it's just a small community. 
that there are people know everyone in the community. So making sure that you build those networks and that you're talking with folks is a really good way to, to, I guess, branch out and be successful. Uh, most of the folks know everybody. And so if you have good integrity and you follow up on what you say you're going to do, you know, people are willing to help you help work with you and provide contacts and share that type of thing. Right. So it's, it goes back to kind of how do we get involved in an internship or how do I, I do something? And it's all about who do you know? And a student may not know everybody yet, but that faculty member knows more people. And if they don't know the right people, then they even know who to go talk to. So it's all about building those connections and networks, I think is a really good way to get to be successful and just be true to who you are. Yeah. Ooh, that the the networking thing is is so important. And I think you're doing a great job in your your classes doing that, especially with the poultry fellows. Getting the contact between the industry and the students is super important. Um also would like to shout out uh that you won the the early career in teaching last year the award at poultry science association so um if don hasn't convinced you yet how to be successful as a teacher then <laughs> maybe you should take a listen again because she's a, an award winner so it's pretty awesome to have someone like don here at iowa state um thank you so much for your time this has been been really enlightening and fun yeah thank you glad we got to chat sometimes we don't get the opportunity to do this we had to do a podcast to have some dedicated time. <laughs> oh, I'll have to pencil this in a little more frequently. <laughs> Sounds good. Too funny. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.